Okay, here we are. What is it? June 5th and episode 700. 700. I can't even wrap my head around that. 700 episodes, like 100 and I think 35 or 40 on Patreon. Some, you know, 10 or 12 dark Fonzies, some 56 grails. It's it's crazy. I mean, and it's it's wild. I think it's we're on the 11th year, 700 episodes. And, you know, I'm not stopping. <laughs> I'm not stopping. It's not a small podcast. It's not a huge podcast. But the people that listen to it are fantastic. So I do it for you guys. And that's just the truth. I tell you that uh, right, right now. That is exactly why I do it. And also, just over the years, all the fantastic guests and the yeah, you know, it's a lot of dream guests, a lot of fun times. And uh, thank you for tuning in today. It's a solo episode, but I will tell you this. There's some great guests coming up in the next couple of weeks. I'm not going to tell you who they are, but uh, I do enjoy doing the solo episodes every uh, couple of weeks or so. So thanks for checking those out. Seems like a lot of people like the solo episodes. So I got uh, I got no problem doing them. They're fun. You get to uh, hear a little bit about what's going on with me instead of interviewing someone. And then they go, man, you talk about yourself too much. <laughs> fucking fuck you. <laughs> fucking people. Uh, podcast sponsor. Before we go further, I want to get into this right now. Last week, I told you about Ergo. I had Ergo on the, the hearing aid episode. And I know a lot of you have some uh, hearing issues like myself. I've been using Eargo now for about a month. You can't see them because they're not on the outsides of the ears. They are on the inside and they're very small. And you can go check them out on their website. And you can get $360 off if you use my code. And my code is D. What is it? Hold on. It's 360 Dean. Let me get that right here. 360 Dean is the code and this is where you go so you can get these and check them out ergo e-a-r-g-o dot me m-e slash dean that's going to get you right there and you can get the latest model the ergo sevens they're microscopic super small they look like a, a a small fly they go in your ear they stay charged for a long time and you can set them all up on your cell phone on an app Super easy. Let's wipe out the stigma of the hearing aid. I got glasses. You can see them on my face right here. Nobody's going like, look at this dummy. That's the weirdness about the hearing aids. People are like, oh, he wears hearing aids. He must be dumb, which is insane because that means uh, most of the world is dumb because this loud world that we live in and, uh, you know, rock and roll, motorcycles, uh, headphones. I always got headphones on at the gym. Everything just destroys our hearing. And Ergo is going to help you out. Ergo.me slash Dean. Use the code three. Oh, nope. The code is Dean 360. That is the code. Dean 360. D-E-A-N 360. Get yourself a discount. A lot of people out there rocking them. A lot of your favorite band guys are rocking them. Charlie Benente from Anthrax is how I found out about them. And I'm glad I did. Check them out. Um, okay, we got that out of the way. Let's dive in to the episode, my friends. First up, uh, I want to uh, wish a Mr. Bill Burr a happy birthday, which is coming up here this week. And I'm going to be on the road, so I won't see him. I will be in Santa Rosa on Thursday and two shows in Alameda, Friday and Saturday. Shows are on the website, deandelray.com. But his birthday is coming up. And I wanted to, uh, you know, figure out something cool to do. I shot him over the uh, 
Brady Bunch house was for sale. And he said, dude, I got to see that. So my good friend, Vivian Yoon, who's one of the best real estate agents in Los Angeles, set it up because you can't just go to the Brady Bunch house because it's for sale. It's 5.5 million. You can't be like, hey, let's go see that. Because the entire Los Angeles and people from the United States would go. That's how popular this house is. It's uh, the second most photographed home in America, right after the White House, which is wild. It's in Los Angeles. It's in Studio City. And it's on this uh, really mellow street. Just a total studio city kind of suburby looking neighborhood. Beautiful street, quiet. And uh, so Vivian set it up. And I thought this would be cool for Bill to see. And also, I wanted to see it bad. I had walked by it for a couple of years. It's in my neighborhood. And I walked Gertie by it all the time. Which, by the way, I will get into that in a minute. Gertie turned seven a few days ago. Gertie is seven. A lot of birthdays this month. So I've walked by it for years. The first time I walked by it, I froze in my tracks because I didn't know the Brady Bunch house was there. I'm just walking down the street and this is how embedded it is in my brain. And most people, I think, in their 50s, late 40s, 50-year-olds, right in there, they all watch the shit out of the Brady Bunch. It's so wild to think about how simple life was. You just come home from school, and what do they call that? Like fucking latchkey kids? I I I I never heard that term until a couple of years ago. Latchkey, I guess like, you know, your parents, your mom. My mom was, you know, a single parent, and uh, she'd just be at work all day. So you come home from school, and you eat some fucking whatever's in the fridge, peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You sit on the couch and you watch TV and you watch the fuck out of it till you go to bed. It is crazy how much TV I watched growing up. And now I watch barely any. I mean, in the last 14 years, whatever, since I started comedy, I watched no TV. I watched uh, Breaking Bad, all of those. I watched all of The Sopranos. I watched all of The Wire. And I watched, um, what else? Something else. And, and really, that's about all the TV I've really watched over the years. You, dude, you watching Succession? Dude, you, you watching Better Call Saul? Dude, are you watching Euphoria? Dude. If I watched every fucking show people recommended to me, I would be the worst comedian. And I'm, I'm and I'm trying to get good. I couldn't even imagine just sitting around watching TV. One, all your material would be about whatever the fuck you watch. And that's what everybody else's material is going to be about. Dude, you're watching Succession, man. You know? And then you're getting ready to go on stage and the guy in front of you is doing his succession joke. And then, uh, and then he's doing his fucking Better Call Saul season finale joke. And then he does a call back to that Tiger King during COVID. Dude, you watching Tiger King? That was the good thing about not doing comedy during COVID. Didn't have to hear any Tiger King jokes. Anyway, I watched the fuck out of TV like crazy, man. It was the Brady Bunch, the Partridge Family, Leave it to Beaver, Adam 12, Gunsmoke, Perry Mason, Sanford and Son, the Jeffersons. Um, what else? Uh, I wasn't flipping you off. Sorry, guys. <laughs> you know, uh, what else? There was that, uh, Adam 12. I said that one. Yeah. Oh, um, Ironside. The guy was like a, like a lawyer in a, uh, in a wheelchair. And these shows were all on after school and they're on some fucking network. Now I forget what it's called, but once in a while we're on the road 
and uh, Bill would go, oh, this is a good channel. We're in the green room and it has all that classic shows. And it's wild to think about the Brady Bunch. Like, it didn't matter if you were like a crazy outlaw rock and roller or you were like a Jesus Bible freak or you were a stoner or or a little did a little meth, whatever. Everybody watched the Brady Bunch. And I don't get it because it's such a fucking straight show. It's just so weird. You know the theme song. You know the story. The fucking Mike loses his wife. Carol loses her husband. We don't know what happened to her husband. You know, they never say. All kinds of weird shit when they're doing a pilot. You know, you throw up a pilot and then you're going like, eh, this ain't working. We got to just get rid of that. Like the girls had a cat, Fluffy. It was only on one episode. Never came around. The boys had a dog, Tiger. And there it is, man. Mike is an architect which I would have got along with him great now. I'd be like, Mike, what about uh, Frank Lloyd Wright? You know, how about Lautner, Neutra? You into those guys? Oh yeah, I hung with those guys. <laughs> you know, maybe Mike hung with those dudes. It was an LA architect. I do remember the one where he lost the plans at Magic Mountain. I remember a shitload of these episodes. I seen them all and it didn't matter if it came on and you're like, oh, I've seen this one. It did not fucking matter. You would just watch it. The Brady's go to Hawaii. This is great. The Tiki fucking little doll. The bad luck Tiki. Oh my God. The Brady's go to Magic Mountain. The volcano in the backyard. That's my favorite. They made the fucking uh, like a homemade volcano. Then the girls were in the back, you know, whatever, playing four square, some bullshit. And then uh, Peter and Bobby, I think it were, they put these two wires together and would shot lava up on the girls. <laughs> and then, of course, the fucking football to the nose on Marsha. All of them. The playing ball in the house. My point is, I'm walking by the fucking house. I don't know it's in my neighborhood. And it stops me in my tracks. I get goosebumps on my arm. Actual goosebumps. Like, holy shit. It's the fucking Brady Bunch house. I Google it, had no idea. There's a security guard in a car there. They have security 24 seven, three security guards exchange shifts and they just sit in their fucking car for eight or nine hours in front of this house. And there's so much to talk about on this house, you know, because I Googled, found out that uh, HGTV had bought it. They had battled Lance from uh, NSYNC, Lance Bass, over it about, I don't know, five, six years ago. It went on the market for like a million bucks. Now, the Brady Bunch house was only used for the outside, and the rest was a set around the corner on the lot. So what you see is the house... But that wasn't what was inside the house. That's the old Hollywood shuffle. The set was uh, totally different than the house. And so when the house went on for sale, the family had lived in it for 60 years. It was a piece of shit, the, the guy told us. And that uh, it was only 2,000 square feet. And it was just all run down. But Lance Bass and HGTV went at it. HGTV won. And they decided to do a TV show with the Brady Bunch cast redoing the inside of the house to make it exactly what it was like on TV, which is almost impossible at first when you think about it, because it's, you know, multiple bedrooms and multiple different rooms. They got the TV den. You ever go over to your rich friend's house when you're young and they got like a TV room? You're like, TV room? What the fuck is that? We had one room. The TV was there. We ate in that room. We slept in that room sometimes. That was it. There was no other rooms. You had your bedroom and you had the fucking other room. So anyway, it's up for sale. 5.5 million. And uh, they, the TV show, you can see it somewhere. I watched a bunch of it on YouTube. 
They redid it. It's unfucking believable. So it was a dream of mine to go in and if I could ever go in there and see that. You know, you talk to the security guard, try to bribe him with, with a couple fucking donuts and some tickets to the comedy store or something. Dude, come on, man. Here's a couple of tickets to the comedy store. Just let me in there. No way. So it's up for sale and Vivian gets it hooked up. I'm excited for Bill to see it. Like, this is a cool kind of thing. He's, he's done a lot of cool shit for me. So there we are. We're in front of the house. We're about to go in. The guy that showed it to us uh, was really fucking cool. He's wearing a Rolex Explorer. Good watch. Which, by the way, I got the, uh, I got the uh, Swatch Omega collab, finally. The, uh, I got the Mars one which uh, those have been out about a year now and they're so hard to get still, but nobody's really talking about them anymore. I put a rubber strap on it. There it is right there. And man, these are cool as shit. It's just a Speedmaster with a collab with Swatch. It's made of plastic, but it's fucking cool. So the guy opens the door. It's me, Bill and Vivian. We walk in, we went around the side actually. We went around the side. We didn't go through the front door. We went around this backyard. There it is. You're in the backyard, Tiger's Land, where the kids were fucking throwing the football and the volcano. You're back there. They opened up the slider door. We went into the kitchen. It's just like the TV show. Remember, they went out the side there from the kitchen. We walk in. There's the kitchen. It's fucking insane. It's orange and uh, like seafoam green for mica. It's got all the vintage appliances and it's, it's unreal. That's the first thing we see and our minds are blown. Bill and I are just like, no way. Whoa. And to the left is the TV room for the kids where they sit around and watch TV. And then right behind the kitchen is a little hallway, Alice's bedroom and uh chill area. Probably where her and Sam sneak a little making out. Once in a while, <laughs> I remember her, her uh, boyfriend, Sam, the butcher, the show is twisted. It's crazy how fucking embedded it is in our hearts and our brains. Just unreal, fun TV, only on for five seasons, wasn't even a success until it went into reruns and, and became one of the biggest popular shows of all time in the rerun era. So we see the kitchen and then the dining room. Then the guy takes us into the living room. Of course, the living room is the most famous part of the house with that incredible mid-century type stairway with the cool mid-century kind of motif of wood and orange paneling and green paneling. The photo is in my Instagram. It's me, Bill, and uh, Vivian. Vivian is Asian. And of course, Bill and I, uh, white and bald. And I was, I said that if the Brady Bunch happened right now, this would be like the woke bunch. They would make the Brady Bunch woke. You know, they'd be like, we need a gay guy. Dean, you're a gay guy. And, and Bill, you're married to an Asian woman. And, uh, and then we got the, uh, you know, adopted kids. Yeah, the Brady Bunch is all adopted now. And they're from different parts of the world. This is uh, Timmy, he's from Saigon. And this is uh, Stuart, and he is from uh, Canada. <laughs> and this is Jimmy, and Jimmy is from the UK. It's just all kinds of different races and, and, uh, and, and you know, everything, different religions and sexualities, you know? It's so funny to think about the woke bunch. <laughs> anyway so there we were on that iconic stairway we went up the stairway now the house was a real small two-story the original house but the set made it look huge so they made this thing huge from 2,000 square feet to 4,500 square feet and it is fucking insane you go up and there you are the girls room it's all pink Cindy, Jen, and Marsha's rooms, little beds and uh, photos. The whole place is decked out like it's Brady Bunch, you know, TV. 
They got like family photos. They got all kinds of stuff from key episodes, like when Jan wrote um, wrote the the dude from the monkeys, and remember he came down. That that's there, the handwritten letter. And then the Jack and Jill bathroom, meaning it's a, a bathroom in between the boys' room and the girls' room. You go through the Jack and Jill into the boys' room. There it is, the bunk beds, Bobby's. Don't don't sit on my bed note and all this shit. It's insane. You're now you are knee deep in the Brady's. You can't even fucking believe it. There's so many emotions flying over me. Like, wow, this is just fucking nuts. Life was so simple. There's no talks of vaccines and fucking politics and you suck and fuck you. Any of that. You're just in this kind of pure world of the Brady's. It's fucking nuts. Oh, well, I just remembered there was one. I think it was Stabler. Uh, Ken Stable or some football player came over. There's so many fun ones. So we anyway, they so then we go downstairs again after seeing that. We go into Mike's study. Remember, he had the study where it has the architectural uh the drawing table. That's all there. There's like plans, all looking like blueprints. And then we go across the hall to their room. And this was an edgy show. It was the first time you saw a couple in bed together. They were in bed together. Remember the like the leave it to beaver and all that shit. Separate beds for the parents. The parents were doing any fucking. They had to pop over real quick onto the uh, little twin bed, get some uh, magic going, and then get back into their bed. But not with the Brady's. They were in their bed fucking. <laughs> they're letting you know she'd always be wearing like a nightgown that is so in 1969 that's like whoa man that ain't cool and some parts of america right now they would think that ain't cool you know they're like i don't know man jesus doesn't like that the bible does not permit that <laughs> anyway uh so they were in their room and oh, I didn't know this. I forgot this. The guy said that back then uh, TV wasn't allowed to show fucking bathrooms. What about that rule? You can't show a bathroom on TV in 1969. That is crazy to me. So then we went um, down into this other hall. Now, uh, the last season... Greg Brady felt he was uh, uh, older now and he didn't want to share a room with his little punk brothers. He wanted his own room. So they made the attic into his little stoner den. He had like beads and he's wearing glasses and far out, man. And he, he was embarrassed to be around his family for like a couple of episodes. And then he realized he missed his square family because the cool people, no matter how many beads and patchouli oil and, glasses he wore they didn't accept him they're like you suck you family boy get out of here <laughs> and then uh oh there was that one episode where uh peter punched that guy the bully in the face the bully was like hey you little and peter just Wah! punched him a lot of memories so we were in there bill and vivian after a little while they're like this is this is kind of creepy. I don't know why they thought it was creepy, but they're like, ah, this is kind of weird. And I was like, this is fucking cool. But you got to think, man, there's no way anyone could buy that and live in it because you would have to have security or a big gate up because it's the most photographed house. And in this fucking TikTok world, everyone and their mom would drive up, get out, and be on your front door like TikTok and like the Brady Bunch, the Brady Bunch, da da da. And it's like three in the morning. They're all fucked up on ecstasy, singing the Brady Bunch in front of your front door. And also, if you're anybody that has 5.5 million, they're going to know you're rich because all the other houses in the neighborhood are like a million, a mil five or something. So you'd be like, this fucker's rich. Let's rob him. And next thing you know, you got a once upon a time in Hollywood type of Manson thing. They're hopping the fence and kidnapping you. 
you know, in this crazy world of follow home robberies and insanity out there. So you're fucked. You can't buy it. You can't live in it. You could buy it, but you can't live in it. And then I thought, well, this would be the ultimate Airbnb. 20 grand weekends. People would do it. You get like 10 people. They all go in and they stay in the place. It's huge. It has tons of bedrooms. It, it could easily sleep 20 people. And you have a Brady Bunch fantasy weekend or whatever. But anything you did you couldn't trash this place it's beautiful it's a piece of art inside so it would be a great airbnb but all the neighbors i guarantee would sign some kind of petition and say fuck you with your airbnb and your party house so that would be screwed then the other idea is to buy it and just rent it out for tv commercials and photo shoots and specialty stuff like um, say Rolex wanted to show off a new watch and they have a private party in there and you have like, you know, food and booze and they show off new watches, any kind of high end shit, uh, a movie premiere party, whatever, but any kind of shit, the neighbors are going to be furious. So I really don't know what they're going to be able to do with this house. And now I'm obsessed with following it. Cause first of all, I love architecture. I love real estate. And I, I want to find out what happens with this house. So we went there and uh, it was, it was really fun. And uh, oh, I'll, I'll post up the link for the house for sale. So you can see all the photos. Really cool. They only let us take one photo. We took it in the stairway. And uh, thank you, Vivian, for getting us in there. And uh, it was cool to do that with you, Bill. Good good times, for sure. Uh, as well, those old TV shows, man. Partridge Family was the other one, which was a family with no dad. You know, no fucking dad. They had Reuben Kincaid, their manager, who was kind of like a semi-dad. And uh, and that was the other show, which was like a family show. Other than, you know, like Leave it to Beaver and all those shows. These were just different. They were 60s flavored. Totally, you know. So, uh, interesting, interesting time to uh, check out that Brady Bunch house. I want to give a shout out right now to the new patreoners new patreoners thank you for joining the patreon.com slash dean del rey for all your bonus episodes and zoom fest and all that i uh i hope you guys uh are digging the patreon i've been doing a lot of bonus episodes on there which is cool gertie's over here snoring gertie is seven she is seven yeah, man. God, such a great dog. Okay. Uh, we had the wild, wild, uh, what was it? 40 year anniversary of the Us Festival. That happened last week. And I talked about it when I dropped the uh, Triumph Mike Levine uh, episode. And uh, I'm still blown away by the Us Festival. I watched a lot of it over the weekend the three day weekend and man, it is just, it is just a killer. It is just a killer. Make sure you check out all the footage of that on YouTube. A lot of good stuff on there, man. A lot of good stuff. So, uh, Josh breeze, he's the new drummer of the Foo Fighters. I knew he was the new drummer. I could tell a long time ago and I kept texting him. I would text him like once every few weeks and be like, ready for the foos tour. He'd be doing shit like uh, showing a drum kit on his Instagram. I go, is that the one for the foos tour? <laughs> and he would just, I, I mean, imagine, you know, cause he had his 50th birthday a few months ago and I couldn't go cause I was on the road. 
but some friends of mine went and, you know, Grohl was there. Everybody was there. It was a huge fucking birthday party. Bob Rock was there. All these big, big celebrities. Josh Freeze is a big deal. He's played with everybody. He's one of the best drummers ever. And uh, which, by the way, he's done the show, I think, two times. And, uh, you know, he quit Sting. He was playing drums with the uh, uh, Offspring. And you started to see things were happening. All of a sudden, the Offspring had a different drummer. Uh, you know, Devo wasn't quite sure who was going to play drums with him. And you're like, oh, all right. And, you know, there's no other drummer to me that would do that gig uh, justice other than Josh Breeze or Brad Wilk from Rage, which is an interesting thing to me because I really can't believe that jo or uh, Brad has not been snatched up by somebody, you know, because this guy is one of the best drummers out there. And, you know, uh, who knows what's going on with Rage. But in the meantime, you know, he did Rage, he did Audio Slave, he played on the Sabbath record, the last one, and he just kills. And I was always always furious that black Sabbath did not take him out on that end tour because this fucking guy's groove and feel is incredible. And he's an amazing hang. He's not a fuck up. He's in shape. He looks great. He plays like a fucking killer. I mean, this guy is hall of fame. First pick if i needed a drummer in a band i'd be like oh yeah let's just get brad you know him uh for that kind of music like foo fighters oh my god now for kind of uh classic rock it's steve gorman for me all day long uh when i think about crushing classic rock drummers type of ac dc uh you know just that kind of rock Bring on Steve Gorman, but for funky groove and 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 kick ass vibe, it's Brad Wilk or Josh Freeze, and I would probably go with Brad because Josh, he you know he's got like eight million gigs he could do. So man, congrats though he's out there killing it. He's got the big smile on the face, playing the fuck out of the Foo Fighters. I don't really listen to the Foo Fighters. Um, they were just never really a, a band that I got into. I know they got some great songs and I, I, I hear the songs. And I'm like, God, that guy can write a song. But I really love the danger of Nirvana. And I love the danger of uh, that kind of three piece that was going on. And, and, and Foo Fighters, you know, fuck, man, they've been around, I think, like 25 years now or something. And congrats to that. I mean, they're an arena rock band, which is almost impossible to do. An arena, anything. Arena rock band, arena comedian, arena uh, hip hop. Arena is hard to do. But it just the Foo Fighters, I, I don't own any of the records, but I've seen them a few times live. My buddy Rami Jaffe's in the band. And I and I love what uh, Dave Grohl's done with uh, Queens of the Stone Age and also the films that he did, that one on um, St Sound City and also that other, uh, what is it, Sonic Highways. I thought that was fantastic. The documentary of different music uh, communities like uh, Seattle, San Fran, the desert, all of that. And uh, the DC one, that was one of my favorites. So yeah, Josh Freeze is in there. And that's, of course, last week's news. But I still wanted to talk about it because Josh is a friend of mine. And uh, it was so funny, man. I, I, I just texted him. I was like, all I wrote was, oh, yeah. You know, and then he texted me back, my songs. Because <laughs> that was a joke I had, like, Sting when he... He does the residency in Vegas. He just puts up there my songs. 
And these aren't Stuart Copeland songs. These aren't Andy Summer songs. These are my songs. <laughs> it just kind of blew my mind when I saw it. I still think one of the coolest things I've seen in the last 10 years was uh, Sting's rehearsal in Vegas, private rehearsal, uh, like a dress rehearsal for his uh, residency in Vegas. Josh invited me. I sat in like the third row. Gertie went. We were just in the seat watching Sting just destroy it. Sting just looking great, sounding, I mean, exact to the fucking records, playing the shit out of the bass. The guy just a fantastic human. So uh, congrats to Josh Freeze. And man, I'm sure his bank account has just went up a few notches and also a little peace of mind like, well, I know I'm going to be uh, working for the next year at uh, the highest level, which is cool. And Josh has never done anything for money, man. I mean, he was playing with Devo because he loved Devo. You know, that is fucking cool. Josh was a huge Devo fan like me. And then he ends up playing drums in Devo. That's like, that. that's beyond cool. So uh, there you go. But man, I hope Brad Wilk lands something rad. I mean, it would be so cool to see Brad land something. I don't even know what would be uh, the great gig for him. But here's a guy, years are going by, and he can play the shit out of the drums. We got to get him in something, man. We got to get him. Queens has got Theodore, so that's taken. And Foos is good. Zeppelin ain't ever going out. <laughs> He'd be interested in Zeppelin. Uh, Aerosmith would have been great to see him in Aerosmith. You know, they, they, uh, Joey Kramer's not doing this last tour. Aerosmith's on their farewell tour. Holy shit. They're never going to play again. I better get a fucking ticket. Man, a farewell tour. They would, fans wouldn't, call it a farewell tour if it wasn't a farewell tour, right? I mean, no way would they do that. <laughs> Aerosmith, Black Crows, Aerosmith farewell tour coming up. Black Crows are on it. Good Bill uh, probably won't go. I've seen both those bands, both of them. Seriously, I've seen the Black Crows. I think it's 70, 75 times I've said it before. I, I added it up years ago. I can't really remember. And Aerosmith, I've seen them every every tour since 78. I've seen them all, man. 78. One of my favorites was, uh, other than Dan the Greens, was, um, oh, they did the Back in the Saddle slash Done With Mirrors tour. That was a fucking tour because they were still kind of junked up. And they opened with Back in the Saddle, and it was just killer. Done With Mirror is an underrated record. I've said it over and over and over on here over the 11 years, 700 episodes. Ted Templeman produced. Fantastic record. I don't even think the band likes it. They don't play very many or any songs off it. I love Sheila. I love My Fist, Your Face. Uh, the whole record is killer. I love the album cover with the reversed fucking shit. That's a great record. It's always weird when a band has this killer record and it didn't sell a lot, so then they just slag it. I never understood that, you know? But I do love that record. So, uh, yeah, man, Aerosmith going out. Are you going to go see that? Are you going to go see Aerosmith on the last run with the Black Crows? I'm 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 trying to see other things, man. I really want to try to see that Les Claypool out there doing the uh, what's he doing? He's doing the Animals record. God, I want to see that. I don't know, you know. I, I'm I, I, like I said uh, last year. I'm not really going to very many concerts. I'm just trying to do stand up comedy. That's all I really want to do, and. Uh, at 57, I've kind of seen everybody, unless it's Bungle or Marcus King 
or newer stuff that comes through that I really want to see, like the Black Delta movement or, uh, you know, all them witches I'll see anytime. I missed them at the Troubadour. I was just working. I'm not going to take a night off of comedy to go see uh, a band unless I have that night off. I really want to see Dead & Co. on this run. It's their last run. And I know this is this will be their last run for real. But uh, Dead & Co., I said it a few weeks ago. And now we're like, I think, five shows in or so on the tour, six shows. They sound better than ever. They are just blowing my fucking mind, man. I cannot believe how good they sound. And I don't know what it is, but man, they are a different band. Look how wrinkly my shirt is. I'm wearing a banker shirt. Banker Guitars. This episode's brought to you by Banker Guitars. Boutique guitars made by Matt himself. Banker Guitars. Everyone's playing them. You know it. Mastodon's playing them. Uh, Scott Holiday from the Rival Sons is playing them. Everybody plays Banker now. Check them out. <laughs> I just fucking threw that out because it's like a, it's like it's. I love his shirt, by the way. I love his guitars. Rival Sons got a new record out. Came out on Friday. It says Smoker, Dark Fighter. There's a last song on it. Oh my God, hold on, let me get this song. It just kills me. It is so good. Hold on, what's it called? Dark Fighter. A lot of new records out this week. New uh, Rancid, new uh, Rival Sons, new Buck Cherry. I had Josh on a few weeks ago from Buck Cherry. Dark Side. This is an eight song record. Perfect, 40 minutes. That's all you need. Like a 70s record. Here, here's eight killer fucking songs. Dark Side, the last song on the record. Just brutal. I love it. And then, of course, Rapture. Bird in the Hand could be the best song I've heard this year. Nobody Wants to Die. That single should have done way bigger than it did. That is one of the catchiest rock songs I've heard in a long time. Opens up with Mirrors. Great, great record. They're out on tour right now with the record company and Starcrawler. They're out there uh, tearing it up. So, Rival Sons, new record out. Very cool, and I hope they, uh, I hope they jump on some big tour this summer. You know, there's still time to uh, get on some kind of tour. They're out headlining, but uh, they've been doing a lot of those Greta Van Fleet dates. Greta Van Fleet's got a new record coming out in July. We'll see what that sounds like. Lots of records. Queens of the Stone Age is coming out this Friday, I believe. And I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I heard the record, and it is fucking great. I'm going to tell you that right now. This Queens of the Stone Age record is fire. And the last one was Villains. They, they took a chance and did a little something different. And before that, like clockwork, just like clockwork is just insane to me. And this record kind of uh, picks up a little after like clockwork, man. The lyrics are unreal. The record is unreal. And uh, holy smokes. I think it's out this Friday. I'm almost positive. Gertie's over here snoring. She's in a heavy snore mode. <laughs> granny gertie so all right that's my little music talk there for episode 700 now let's get into something crazy i was watching 60 minutes which i've been watching since i was a kid i love 60 minutes and they uh a lot of talk these days about ai ai is a scary motherfucker there's even a lot of people trying to pass the votes to get rid of ai because it could be the end of mankind as we know it. And uh, that might sound like an exaggeration, but when you start to think about it, it's pretty wild to think about how AI could get pretty gnarly out there. All different uh, situations. If they weaponize AI, that's the first scary one. Weaponize, you're like, what are you talking about? I'm talking about somebody doesn't want you 
at the work anymore, at the job, but they can't fire you because they'll get sued. So then they magically have the AI of your voice saying like the N word or something. And next thing you know, they're like, well, sorry, John, you said the N word multiple times here on this phone call. And you're like, that ain't me. And they're like, yeah, it is. That's a, a, a weaponized in, in, in a, a sort, you know, get your ass fucking canceled, gone forever. Then there's another way that it could really fuck people up. And that's, of course, what they're talking about, the AI music and the AI uh, script writing. And I don't know if you've ever used AI yet, but let's say you want to do a description of uh, like a home you're selling. My buddy did this. And then he just put in some keywords, the city it was in, the school uh, school community it was in. And then AI was like, a fantastic home. Perfect for a three, uh, three fam, you know, three children family, uh, great schools. It's got a copper roofing with a groovy backyard. You're going to love the sunsets on the evening on the west side. Two car garage for your Porsche and your Tesla charging car. And also, don't forget, right next door to an In-N-Out burger, whatever. So AI is going to get gnarly. There's a writer strike right now in LA. And the greed machine's like, fuck these writers. Let's just pop in. We want a show that's like Breaking Bad. And AI just starts writing up some fucking shit. Or we want a song in the tone of Drake. Come on, let's just go. Next thing you know, Drake style song. Spotify ain't paying anyone because they made the songs. We don't need you anymore. Then it's going to get into lawsuits. No, nope, it says Drake style. You can't use my style. All kinds of fucking crazy shit's going to happen. But the main thing that is scary right now, and I watched it on 60 Minutes, was AI robbing people with scams, mostly old people. And you think you can't get scammed? I'm telling you, the internet is the scariest ever right now siphoning out bank accounts and just ruining lives, ruining lives. Here's an AI scam that's happening. Somebody calls you up and they say, Hey man, uh, what's going on? Dean, you go, um, nothing. Who's this? Oh man, it's uh, such and such down here at the auto zone or whatever. You're like, Oh yeah, I don't need anything. And you hang up. Now they got some sample of your voice. They run it in AI. Then they call your grandma and they know how to make it say grandma on the caller ID because they got a fucking app for that now. So you look at the phone. Yeah, you're the old lady grandma and you go, oh, it's Steve. Hi, Steve. You know, her grandson. And then the AI voice comes on. Grandma, I hit somebody in their car and they're going to throw me in prison unless I give them money right now. Oh, no. It sounds just like nephew or grandson Steve or whatever the fuck his name is because they've sampled it and AI is killing it. I just saw an AI conversation and, and you guys probably saw it with Rogan and Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs is fucking dead. And it's a simulated podcast and they both sound exact. It's crazy. So then the grandma's like, oh no, I'll do anything to help you, Steve. And they go, okay, grandma, they're going to send over a courier. Go to the bank and get 20 grand out cash. And these old people are doing it. Now you're thinking, I'm not fucking stupid. I wouldn't do that. Yeah, you would. Because... At, at, at the moment, you're not really thinking, and it sounds just like your fucking wife or your your brother or whatever. And now it, it gets into this. You know, somebody calls you, Dean, man, I need help. I need 20 grand or they're going to kill me. And you're like, that's an AI voice. And then your buddy's dead. And you're like, fuck, I didn't. 
I didn't help my buddy. I thought it was an AI voice. It is fucking getting wacky out there in this world. It really is, man. I can't believe each year I'm alive. I'm kind of glad I'm at 57. I don't know what it'd even be like 30, 40 years from now. People having kids right now. My friend just had a baby a month ago. Can you imagine what they're going to fucking see? If the planet's still there, no nuclear bombs, no fucking world war, whatever. If somehow people end up living right now that were born now and, and they live to be 40, what the fuck are they going to see? Just chips in the head, AI robots walking around. You know, you're like, hey, is that Steve? I'm Steve. What are you doing? It <laughs> just fucking AI pets. Yeah, that's Gertie over there. Uh oh. Well, that's my buddy Joey right there. Call me. He's an AI paranoia, man. <laughs> I'm not paranoid because, you know, I don't have enough money to get robbed. And also, fuck, I'm 57. I don't know. I don't know if AI, I'm, I'm, I'm sure AI in two years from now will be even crazier, but I have no idea what to fucking think. But uh, I'll tell you this, man. AI is scary. And it's not just music and taking jobs. You know, you know, those people don't let the Mexicans in. They take our jobs. Meanwhile, they're just letting the AI just fucking roll right in. You know, these people are dumb. These people are dumb. You know, it's fucking crazy. Don't let the Mexicans in. They're never fucking Hispanic people are great. They're fucking fantastic, man. It's unreal, people. Don't even care about AI. They're like, oh, AI, man, fuck, what is that, man? Next thing you know, they're fucking broke. Some fucking, some fucking voice took my money. Anyway, this was scary shit on 60 Minutes. People were getting kabonked. Bank accounts empty. They're falling for it. One lady fell for it like three different times. I don't know, man. You're sitting there going like, I won't get scammed. Everything's fucking fishy now. Emails clicked on the wrong link. There's those, uh, you know, those fucking QR codes. Those are fucking crazy. They got menus and everything now or QR codes. You go up and scan one and it sends a virus in your phone and empties out your PayPal. That shit's happening. And then there's those fucking dicks that pop those things right onto the onto the uh, swipers at like CVS. When no one's looking, they just pop their own fucking swiper on. You go and you swipe your card. They come back and they pop the thing off. They have like 700 cards info. People are fucking robbing out there. And then you got the old school robbers with just guns. They're out there just robbing people for their watches and, and all kinds of dumb shit. It is combat out there, man. It is a fucking combat war zone. Unreal. Unreal, man, how fucking nutty it's gotten in the last five years. Fuck, I don't know, man. I blame the vaccine on AI. AI, fucking vaccinate the AI. <laughs> oh, man. Now I'm just looking at some notes here before I cut out. I want to thank all of you for, uh, like I said, tuning in every week, 11 years, 700 episodes. Merch is at deandelray.com. I got some tree hoodies and hats. I got some Gertie sweatshirts left. I'll be out on the road this week, Santa Rosa, like I said. And uh, hold on, I got some other dates too with Burr. I got some arena dates. Here they are. I'm going to my I'm going to my trusty website. So um here they are. Tour dates, bull, uh, barrel proof lounge, Santa Rosa, Thursday, Faction Brewing, Alameda, Friday and Saturday, Giant Center with Bill Burr, um, June 22nd, June 23rd. Uh, they're all on there. I don't know. There's a, a shitload of uh 
uh, dates here. Oh, man. Anyway, hope to see you guys out there. And uh, go to the website, Dean Del Rey, for all your info. And please leave a review on the podcast on iTunes. I can only ask you uh, every week. Please do it. It really helps. Somebody wrote a couple new reviews this week. It's funny. If just five people did it this week, it would help. It blasts the podcast up into the top 50. And that Jason Newstead episode is still fucking exploding. Hats off to Jason. I talked to him. He said his gig went great out there in Florida with his solo band, Newstead. He fired that back up. If you haven't heard the Jason episode, go tune into it. And uh, looking forward to seeing you guys. And candles are lit. Thank you for tuning in.